This is a Talk Station original podcast. This is Christine Brin. This week on Salty History, we'll be talking with Mike Carraway from the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort about Steed Bonnet, who has the unfortunate reputation of the worst pirate of the golden age of piracy. We'll be talking about how he is not, in fact, the worst pirate, touching on topics such as the Jacobites, politics, Blackbeard, Royal James, revenge, and more. It all starts right now on Salty History. Christine Brin. I'm an associate curator at the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort, and today I have with me Mike Carraway. I am Mike Carraway. I am the curator of exhibit and design for the North Carolina Maritime Museum system, and that includes Beaufort, Southport, and Hatteras Museums. Now, I've been with the museum in Beaufort for about 14 years now, and during that time had the joy and of studying pirates, and I believe you've been with the Maritime Museum system significantly longer than that. Uh, significantly, but only barely, about 17 years now. And during that time, you've definitely had the chance to study pirates. More than you would ever want. Which gives us a great background and opportunity to discuss one of North Carolina's forgotten pirates. Now, everybody knows that the infamous Blackbeard came to visit North Carolina, but there is another pirate associated with North Carolina that we're going to talk about today, and that is the pirate of Steed Bonnet. Now, Steed Bonnet is most closely associated with North Carolina because he does visit our coast a couple times, and he is captured on our coast down in Cape Fear, Cape Fear Inlet, if I'm correct. Uh, yeah. Actually, the Cape Fear River. Cape Fear River. Today, there's a place called Bonnet Creek that apparently the Battle of the Sandbars, it's called, took place back in 1718. He was ultimately executed down in Charlestown, or Charleston as we know it today. One of the things that I specifically wanted to talk about with Steed Bonnet was the fact that he has this unfortunate reputation of being the worst pirate ever especially of the golden age of piracy. And for those that don't know, when I mention the golden age of piracy, what I am referring to is a period about 1650 to 1720. Different historians will tell you different periods of time in the Atlantic coast, right off of the coast of North America and down in the Caribbean and the the islands. And at that time, there were roughly, I've heard different historians guesstimate about couple thousand to five thousand different pirates roaming the waters and steed bonnet was one of them and has unfortunately as i said gotten that reputation as the worst pirate and i argue that he is not the worst pirate and correct me if i'm wrong mike i think you agree with me i do it's uh definitely not the worst pirate he was unusual Mm -hmm. uh, unusual in many ways most pirates find themselves in that position because of their economic state the fact they can't find work anywhere else. It's kind of a desperation thing. But apparently our boy Steed decided that he wanted to be a pirate. Yeah, Steed was born as a gentleman down in Barbados. In in 1688. 1688. He was raised up with a liberal education, a wealthy upbringing, was set up with acres of land that he inherited, married a woman, ultimately inherited property through that marriage as well, which earned him the name, the um, rank of major. We were discussing this before. Some sources will say that he worked his way up through the militia. Likely, he never marched. He never joined the militia. He certainly didn't seem to have any military experience particularly on the sea, and that is much different than land-based militia experience. But back at that point, if you owned land because of the probability, in fact, of slave risings, you were required to have a rank of some sort in the militia. Mm -hmm. And because he owned actually substantial holdings, his rank was a little higher than most, and so he was Major Steed Bonnet. And then later, he has... Fairly, it looks like, typical upbringing for a wealthy plantation owner. But early into his marriage, he has a young son, 
Allenby? Do you know how to say the name? I know how Allenby to spell it. Allenby is the last name of his wife and became the first name of his youngest son. Well, not um, his youngest son, but his first son. No, his first son. Sorry. Yeah. And, but he died. He died and, in 1712. And it's supposed to be that that was kind of a turning point in Steed Bonnets. Very possibly. You hear a lot about Steed basically doing strange things. One of the things that he did as a pirate is he decided that he was going to go and purchase a ship. Some mm-hmm. sources say he had it built from the ground up. That's not true. He basically purchased a suitable sloop and then sent it to the shipyard to have it rebuilt into basically a pirate vessel. Now, was it true that while he was having it rebuilt and people would question kind of what he was fixing to do, he told them that he was going to go hunt pirates, not become a pirate? He had this uh, ambition of getting a letter of mark and reprisal, which has basically become a privateer to hunt the Spanish on the high seas. Oh, he had that ambition at this point. At, at, mm-hmm. And that was a fairly early ambition for him. And basically it was a ruse to uh, do what it was he really wanted to do, and that was go pirating. It's very interesting that he also, when he finally got his ship ready, he, he hired a crew. Most pirates are... They operate on what booty you take, and then you get divisions according to Mm -hmm. what your position is on the ship. Steve Bonnet paid his guys a regular wage. Now, this is one of the first points that I want to point out. I've had the theory that it's a sign that Steve Bonnet was actually a genius, a mad genius possibly, but a genius, because there was a historian I read that argued that by paying the pirates and owning his ship outright, he put them in an awkward place and they couldn't rise up against him in the way a traditional pirate crew could. I think that's correct, too, because he knew that he did not have the experience Mm -hmm. as a sailor. And one of the things you often hear with this accusation he's the worst pirate ever is he didn't have experience and he didn't operate his ship and the, the pirates that were underneath him didn't respect him. But what's being forgotten is most pirate ships did not operate with the captain of the crew in charge of the ship most of the time. When the ship was in combat, was actually taking a prize, the captain became the leader of the crew, and they, he directed the attacks. He chose the, the ships. Sometimes it was done by acclamation of the crew, but most of the time the captain chose the prey, basically. But the sailing master is the person who ran the ship on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, so his experience was not necessary for that part. Right. But it also helped to have a little bit more information about things yeah. than he seemed to have. One major issue is that when he first started pirating, he was quite successful, and they took several ships going up as far as New York. And yeah, then, he takes four ships right off the bat. Right off the bat, and does really, really well. Then he decides he wants to go over to Nassau and draw into this new group of pirates that are there that seems to be very attractive to pirates at that time. And on his way over, he decides he's going to attack this really big, what he thinks is a merchant ship. Mm -hmm. It turns out to be a Spanish warship. Yes. And ends up getting revenge beaten to pieces. He loses nearly half his crew, either killed or wounded. And he himself is very, very severely wounded. Yeah. And the ship itself only escapes because it is a significantly smaller and faster ship than the man of war. And this is another, like you said, example that people will pull on saying, this is proof that he was a bad pirate. He chose to attack this man of war. But imagine if he had succeeded. Right. The name he would have made for himself. If, if a, we talk about his nemesis and friend, however you want to look at it, Blackbeard, one of the things that made his reputation as strong as it was is because he actually, although we don't know that this actually happened, it probably didn't, But there's HMS Scarborough that Blackbeard was supposed to have attacked Mm -hmm. and basically battled it to a draw, which would be quite a major thing because Scarborough was what they called a fourth rate, and that's a fairly large warship. 
there's no record in Scarborough's uh, logs yeah. to say that that actually took place. But that was part of Blackbeard's reputation. And it doesn't matter if it actually happened or not. A pirate's reputation was their greatest weapon. Indeed it was. I mean, I think in those four ships that he takes initially, Steed Bonnet said like two of them gave in without just at the sight of a pirate flag. Precisely. So the reputation of pirates is really one of their most powerful tools. So right. if he could have gotten a reputation for having taken a man of war. And Bonnet, remember, now he's wounded. And when they go to Nassau and they mm-hmm. meet Blackbeard, a lot of the, the information that we kind of have coming down to us that basically pegs Bonnet as being a terrible pirate is because of this, this, this organization that he doesn't seem to have. And then he gets tied up with Blackbeard, and Blackbeard seems to take over from him. Mm-hmm. But remember, he's been severely wounded. We yeah. don't know how badly that was, but apparently it was... Fairly, fairly badly. And I've read one other source that said that that injury was probably exasperated by the fact that he was suffering from depression. So he, on top of being hurt, he probably relapsed in a way, potentially. And it's worth noting that most of the information we have is coming through a filter of two sources, such as Charles Johnson's General History of Pirates and the trial records that were known for having kind of altering the stories to further their ends. For example, General History of Pirates, they were interested in selling a book. Right. So to make him more of a comic relief character, they might have accentuated some of his mis- like misdoings to make him more comic. And exactly. the British government also had a vested interest in making him look a little bit foolish because then they're like, don't go into piracy. You'll look like a fool like this guy. Well, there was also some political things going on at the time, and we, <laughs> we can talk about that as well because... We look at Steve Bonnet, and there's been the rumors that he went into piracy because his wife was not a very nice person and berated him constantly. That comes from Charles Johnson, he yes. He ran away, basically, ran from his marriage. That is, and Johnson is the only record that we have of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there may be other reasons, and there may be some very definite political reasons involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that... That politics play a part in surprisingly a lot of the pirates' careers. Right. Now, when he ends up meeting with Blackbeard that take, at Nassau, that takes a big turn for his career, ultimately. It does. And one of the, the issues with that is, of course, he does lose command of his ship. Blackbeard puts a lieutenant of his, a certain person named Richards, mm-hmm. in charge of Revenge. And Revenge, of course, is the name of Bonnet's ship at that time. And Revenge actually fits into the political makings of what we will talk about. Yep, and we'll touch more on the politics of it, Revenge, and Blackbeard's part of his career after this. Just as a quick recap, we were talking about Steve Bonnet, what I like to call North Carolina's other pirate, and we were discussing how he, though he has the reputation for being the worst pirate of the golden age of piracy, our argument is that he is not, if only for the argument that you have heard of him. But we've been going through his career. We started off talking about his early career and how he came to be a pirate, and we ended off with a very important part of his career, or turning point, where he's now in Nassau, and he'd been injured, and his ship had been torn up, and his crew had been decimated from a poorly planned attack on a man of war, a Spanish man of war. That happened in 1717, correct? That's yeah, correct. we're still in 1717. My argument was, yeah, it was, it was a gamble to attack that warship. To lose, he obviously got himself a poor reputation. To win, he would have been the ultimate pirate and like won that trophy of pirate king. But unfortunately, he lost. And then we were talking about how his story might have been affected by politics going on and some of the politics that might have led to him turning pirate. There is... uh quite a bit of information that we have about politics at that time. And in fact, it was a major turning point in English politics back in Great Britain, which of course affected all the colonies like Bermuda and Jamaica Mm -hmm. and the Indies. So you have people like Bonnet, who, by the way, as a gentleman, he actually had some interesting lineage. His great-great-grandmother 
was Catherine Cromwell. And that is the sister of Oliver Cromwell of the English Civil War fame, who became the director general of the nation, which basically made him king. And he was the one that led the execution of King Charles I. Wow. So his, uh, his sister is Steve Mollett's great-great-great-grandmother. So it comes down to the point where all these people are, are really politically connected. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that his ancestors were on the, on the Cromwellian side, the parliamentarians, they called themselves. Mm-hmm. And it ends up that it's maybe that Steve Bonnet may have been what we call a Jacobite. Mm-hmm. And that comes from the fact that the lineage got a little blurry for a while. On the royal and, family. On the royal family. And back in England, which had only recently at this point turned into the United Kingdom. That's it was correct. only under Queen Anne, who had just passed away. That Queen Anne had just passed away. But under her, and England and Scotland had combined to make United Kingdom. That's correct. When James the Third should have been the new king, mm-hmm. but unfortunately, he was Catholic, and there had been laws passed in Parliament that prevented Catholics from being the king of England. James the Third was her half brother. Her half brother. So James the Third is deposed, and the name Jacobite comes from Latin for James. And those mm, people who did not, not believe that James should be forced off the throne and replaced because only because he was a Catholic. And those people became the ones that are basically pushing this revolution. And it actually broke out in several different times over a period of about 100 years. I was going to say, it keeps coming back up it in history. If anybody's ever watched that show, The Highlander. That's correct. That's the a major theme from the that last, one. The last big revolution related to this was in 1745. And I think they, 1688 was the first revolution. 1688. James and, III's. But we're, I'm sorry, we're going to stick with our, our revolution, which is here with 1715, I think 1715, is. called the Little Rising. There is a lot of evidence that the people in Jamaica, a gentleman named Archibald Hamilton, who was the governor, who was very definitely a Jacobite. And he was accused of replacing good and loyal people with people who were papists and Jacobites, they called them. And so he was replacing the rulers of the the island, and he was getting these people who were pirates to come in because he was apparently trying to build a skilled navy Mm -hmm. to support the people back in England and Scotland who were rising up against the new king, who was, by the way, George I. Yes. And he was German of the Hanoverarians. And George was an interesting character all of himself. Probably could do a whole podcast on him. We probably could. He, He could not speak a word of English and hated England. But he was king of it. But he was the king. And that made him in charge. And, and word so, got back to Parliament that there was a potential uprising of pirates, right? That is correct. And at that point, that was one of the justification behind the crackdown on piracy. And that resulted in Woods Rogers, who had been a pirate himself. He had been a privateer as well. He moved Nassau with a large contingent of Royal Navy vessels and actually land marines so that they basically took over and chased the pirates out of Nassau. Mm-hmm. And they moved over to another area, and they still remained. They called themselves, the pirates did, the Flying Gang. And Steve Bonnet became a member of that. Yeah. And most of the big-name pirates that you hear were all members of this original Flying Gang group. And we know that they basically had Jacobite sympathies because we've got reports of them requiring their captives to toast to the king over the water, which is a reference to James III. So we know Steed Bonnet was a Jacobite, and we also know that Blackbeard was a Jacobite, don't we? That we almost, well, well what as we do much is we as we can to, know. As much as we can know. <laughs> Without we actually point asking to evidence the man. Because Blackbeard named his ship Queen Anne's Revenge, and Queen Anne's was one of, she passed away, and when she died, her half brother became the king, supposedly. That was James III. But she was Protestant, and because she was the last of of those Protestant line, people looked at her as being the true line. And and when the Jacobites looked at James III, then he should be king. 
And that didn't work out that well because of the laws. Yeah. But Which uh, they, interestingly, I think they passed right before she passed away. Exactly. The so. Parliament did, just to kind of tie her hands on that. But as we were saying, Queen Anne's Revenge referred to Queen Anne, the Protestant queen, and the true king, the, true, the line of the true king. Which gives us that very good clue that Blackbeard himself was also a Jacobite, right. which would give a good, strong connection between Steed Bonnet and Blackbeard. And even stronger is what the, the name that Steed Bonnet chose for his ship once and later in his career. The Royal James. That was Royal James. And yes, that's very I didn't blatantly connect that. Royal James. <laughs> and that is a direct reference to James III. Mm-hmm. And many other pirates named their ships. Revenge was an easy, very often used name. Oh, uh, there's Royal a lot of James, names. King you see, Water, Mayflower also. shows up everywhere. It's not May- just on the Pilgrim's ship. No, yeah. Mayflower shows up a lot of the pirates. Which name. makes it tough to study lineage on ships, too. Right. But I digress. So, Steed Bonnet is probably, well, we know a Jacobite connected now with Blackbeard. They both have those Jacobite sympathies. Because one of the things that I know comes up when Blackbeard and Steed Bonnet join forces is why did Blackbeard and Steed, like, why didn't Blackbeard just kick Steed Bonnet off of his ship? At this point, Steed Bonnet is injured. He's on a ship that's been handicapped in Nassau. Blackbeard has recognized the potential prize the revenge is for him as a pirate. And instead of just kicking Steed Bonnet off of the ship, he keeps Steed Bonnet as a, not so much a prisoner, but a respected guest. And there may be a different reason for that than people realize. It turns out, we talked about Bonnet's lineage earlier and that his great, great, great grandmother was Oliver Cromwell's sister. Mm -hmm. Well, she married a gentleman named Whetstone. And the Whetstone family were admirals in the Royal Navy. And so Steed Bonnet's great uncle was a gentleman who was Rear Admiral Sir William Whetstone, who was also the master of a ship called HMS Windsor. And it turns out we have documentary evidence that a very young Edward Thatch, Blackbeard, served aboard HMS Windsor no when way. he was pressed into service from the ship that he was uh, sailing with. Now, I do want to say the caveat that we're not sure this is the same Edward. It's pretty good that it could have been. Yeah, very, very, it's very, very likely. But he's yeah. in the right place, he's at the right age, and he's at the right time. And, in, and That's all an interesting connection. Up. So the connection is, is that Blackbeard may remember fondly because he was he left Windsor on deferment, which meant that he got promoted to a higher level on another ship. Mm-hmm. And we don't yet know what that ship is. We have research ongoing for that. But we will eventually find that out. The Edward Thatch Blackbeard may fondly have looked back on his service and decided that he's going to take care of this. Now, it is also worth noting that ultimately... Blackbeard and Steed Bonnet will join forces and stay together for most of Steed Bonnet's career as a pirate, which also works out to be most of Blackbeard's career. Very good. Um, So even though we look at it and say, oh, well, Steed Bonnet wouldn't be a successful pirate without Blackbeard, the reverse might be said as well. I mean, they might have been assisting each other in different ways and complementing each other as far as Steed Bonnet may not have known much about being a mariner, but he was well-read, according to most sources, so he might have had a lot that he could offer academically to Blackbeard. It is said that he maintained a library aboard uh, Mm -hmm. his ship Revenge. Mm -hmm. So my argument, or our argument, that Steed Bonnet may not have been the worst pirate and that he may have helped bolster Blackbeard in a way, just the way Blackbeard bolstered his career. Ultimately, Blackbeard, um, Steed Bonnet does come free of Blackbeard in 1718. And before we run out of time, I do want to touch on his capture, which is the Battle of the Sandbars. He was careening his ship, meaning that he had pulled it over on one side to clean the bottom, barnacles and that sort of thing, and do repairs to leaks and that sort of thing. The word came down to the, the governor of South Carolina, who sent an expedition actually to capture a pirate called Charles Vane. And there was a six-hour battle once the two ships, or the two ships of Colonel William Rhett, mm-hmm. who was the South Carolinian, sent up to capture this pirate. 
at the end of the battle, Rhett was apparently somewhat surprised to find out it was the Steve Bonnet. Yeah. So and apparently Bonnet had a reputation even at that point. And ultimately, he's captured at that point. They're taken back to Charlestown. And what I do want to note is the fact that Steve Bonnet is tried and found guilty of piracy. And to me, a sign that he was a, had this silver tongue, let's say, of being a good speaker and really selling his case, he ultimately wins so much sympathy that the colonel, Rhett, that captures him takes pity on him and even offers to take him back, escort him back to England to have him retried for piracy. And he escapes, his, he does escape capture at one point. Right. And goes on the lam for, or not on the lam. Four days. Four <laughs> days before being right. recaptured. And eventually he is recaptured mm-hmm. and he's brought back and he does meet his end at the gallows in Charleston and is buried below the high tide line as it's traditional for pirates out in the marsh, and so he apparently rests there to this day, below the tide line. We could sit here for hours and pick apart his career and show just really where history got it wrong, and he really is a surprisingly good pirate. Maybe not a great sailor, as we mentioned at the beginning, but that's not a necessity for being a great pirate. The thought I'd want to leave everybody with is the idea that the worst pirates of the golden age of piracy are the ones that are forgotten. And we remember him. So he's done something right. He made that reputation. He made the reputation, and I think that may have been the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to live forever through that reputation. We'll definitely open to having this discussion more at the museum if anybody wants to come by and chat us up. Because we, well, I love to talk pirates, to say the least. <laughs> um, I think we both do, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. As I said, Mike Carraway and myself, Christine Brin, we work at the North Carolina Maritime Museum. Our website is ncmaritimemuseumbeaufort.com. You can see videos on there of different presentations we've done. You can find our contact information on that website as well if you want to contact either Mike Carraway or myself through email or phone and to continue this discussion or tell us how we are wrong and Steve Bonnet really is a bad pirate. But once again, we're here from the North Carolina Maritime Museum and our website is ncmaritimemuseumbeaufort.com.